Greetings. I've been asked to do the message this week at The Connection, and I've decided I'm going to do it on 15 reasons for calamity, diseases, accidents, afflictions, mayhem, and the Bible. In other words, 15 reasons the Bible talks about why troubles might be in our life. To begin, I want to read this passage from Ecclesiastes. I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate in its time or beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. There are some little phrases in the Bible that are so massive as far as the impact of what this means. He has also set eternity in their heart. Why is it that we normally pray to God? Well, you'd like to think it's because we're thanking Him for things and how good He's been to us. But most of the time, prayer is because we're having trouble. There's something that's coming against our life. Now, if eternity has been set in our heart, the problem is we are in a temporal lifespan, a temporal age. So, because we have eternity set in our heart, the temporalness of this doesn't compute. Put it another way, if temporalness was set in our heart, not eternity, then I think we'd say, okay, we're only going to be here for a little time, so all these griefs and troubles and things that come that beat us back down to the dirt, you know, so what, it's not that big a deal because, you know, we're just temporary. But when you have eternity set in your heart, what that's saying is, I'm alive, it's right that I'm alive, and I'm going to continue to be alive, and anything that comes against my life is seen as an enemy an obstacle at least. And so we push back against these things that threaten our life. So when troubles come, we immediately want to push them away, but if we can't push them away, then we have troubles that come from these troubles. So I'm going to be reading parts of this article, but it's on my website, which I'm going to put on right here, and you can find it and download it. There is purpose behind every negative event that befalls an individual. The potential reason, or reasons, plural, depends upon one's standing with God. One's actual standing, not what you think it is, but your actual standing, will determine which one of these possibilities might be valid. Number one, the reality of this existence, the initial judgment of God. Adam's fall in Genesis is accompanied by a group of judgments from God. The bottom line is that Adam's physical body would now be overcome by the environment. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. If Adam's physical body was already that way before the fall, like evolutionists and longevity models would say, then such a judgment is nonsense. See, if you're already going to die and go back to dirt, well, what kind of judgment is that? But if Adam's body was not subject to being overcome by this environment, then to be told you're going to turn to dust from whence you came is indeed a real judgment. I make the point that what Adam passed on to all of us is a body that cannot survive this environment. Sooner or later, some negative thing is going to kill us. That is just the reality of this existence. Now, for Christians, you'll find things like with David that he slept with his fathers. That means he died. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that he did something wrong at that moment where God then judged him and that's why he died. And you even find Simeon in the temple when Jesus was presented. He said, now my eyes have seen the Christ of God in flesh alive. Lord, let your bondservant now depart in peace. Talking about dying. So it isn't that Simeon maybe he did anything where God's going to judge him for his personal behavior. It's just the reality of this existence. Our body cannot survive this. So he's asking to die in peace. Well, that's an oxymoron, really, in a sense, because death is called an enemy. So he's not welcoming death. It's just the reality that his body cannot survive this. And he's saying, let me go in peace. If I didn't sin from here on out, it doesn't mean that uh, my body's going to be okay and survive this. Something's going to get me. Something's going to get us all. Now, number two, sometimes... It is a direct judgment from God on an individual. This is always in response to some specific incident. Fire came out of the presence of the Lord and consumed 
Nadab and Abihu, that was Aaron's sons, because of what they did with strange fire before the Lord as priests. In other words, they were deciding how they were going to approach God, and God consumed them on the spot. That ought to tell us something. God's the one that makes the rules on how we approach him, how we're accepted by him. And if you think that you can just make up your own rules and come to God as you want, you're totally missing the reality of our situation here. And in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, they lied about the property they had sold, and they died on the spot for having lied, as Peter said, to the Holy Spirit. Herod, after delivering a seemingly great speech, he failed to give God his proper due, and an angel of the Lord struck him, and he was eaten with worms, and he died. He didn't die and get eaten with worms. He's eaten with worms, and then he died. The only reason we know these are direct judgments from the living creator is because he has told us. I'm absolutely certain similar actions occur around us all the time, but they aren't written down. There's one place that says not participating in sexual immorality or covetous, because on account of these things, the wrath of God comes. It's present tense. Jesus has the keys of death and Hades, and he uses them. It is indeed a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. These direct judgments from God, he knows when he's had enough out of somebody or he's just decided their time's done or they've done something that's crossed some line. Who knows? But this is between God and an individual. The third reason I have for troubles can be demon possession. This is particularly dire in my estimation. Fallen angels are phenomenally powerful beings and often mercilessly torment their victims. The Gerasen demoniac, he was possessed by a legion of these angels. He was violent, yet he lived in the tombs and they could hear him crying out day and night. And he was gashing himself with stones. So he was oppressed physically, emotionally, and volitionally. And when Jesus came to that shore, it's like he ran up and bowed down before him. I think that was the man in him, but the legion spoke and said, have you come here to torment us before the time? Jesus said, what's your name? You know, legion, there's many of us. And they started entreating him not to be thrown into the abyss, but into a bunch of pigs. And once that occurred, we're told that Gerasene demoniac, he was then clothed and in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. And those demons were just tormenting him. There's another one, a boy, and, and the fallen angels caused him to be convulsing, and often he was thrown into the fire and into the water to destroy him. They were wanting to kill him. Others suffered physical maladies, like a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. All three of these, Jesus delivered these people from these horrendous afflictions. Now, as far as this woman and this disease caused by spirit, I did make a comment. I have no discernment on which illnesses might be demon-driven. Maybe other people do know. I don't have that discernment that I know of. Now, there's also some accounts, though, where these fallen angels possessing a person, it doesn't mean that they're just tormenting them. There was one slave girl who had a spirit of divination, and she made a lot of money for her handlers. And Paul rebuked and cast the demon out of her immediately that she lost that power. But it doesn't look like she was tormented by them at all. She was at least cooperating with them. And Satan himself went in and out of Judas twice. But whatever the mode of possession, it always ends in death and destruction and havoc. A fourth thing that can befall was demon destruction. And I use the account of Job. Only four servants survived a direct satanic attack. One way was Satan or these demons stirred up marauding bands of killers that came and killed one group. There was a targeted lightning strike, killed a bunch of others, and a wind that collapsed on the eldest brother's house where all of Job's children were and killed all of his children. Now I have no idea if Satan and his still possess this kind of power, but the revelation of John, there's a lot of destructive demonic driven activity and it sinks humanity into various horrific calamities and mayhem. So that's number four. Number five, judgment on a group. While each person will only account for his or her own actions, many times an entire group is judged by God, and calamity comes sooner than it might have otherwise. For example, the flood killed people of all ages, and that was a worldwide judgment that happened. 
Also, the fire and brimstone that came down on Sodom and Gomorrah and the environs, there were people of all ages, and they were judged as a group. Nations that forget him, he warns. He makes the nations great, and then he destroys them. He changes a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. The moment is approaching when his name will be damned one time too many. The end of this age will be a group judgment. So that's another reason why calamity will come. You're part of a wrong group. Number six, reaping what has been sown. There are multitudes of applications to this. If one takes in destructive materials into their body, violating natural law, negative things are going to come. Diseases, who knows what all. If one violates civil law, and is caught, negative things are going to come. And if you violate spiritual law, trouble's going to come. I use this example. Judgment will be merciless to the one who has showed no mercy. If people have shown no mercy, judgment to them is going to be without mercy. That's a spiritual law. If you sow to the wind, do not be surprised if you will then reap the whirlwind. And this reaping is not a one-to-one -one ratio. You just do little things of what you put in your body or little violations of civil law or little acts of no mercy, no mercy, no mercy. Whenever that ship comes home, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It'd be a whirlwind. Afflictions designed to bring one to God. A man might be chastened with pain on his bed and with unceasing complaint in his bones. His flesh wastes away and his bones which were not seen stick out. God does all these things oftentimes with men to bring back his soul from the pit that he might be enlightened with the light of life. I do believe that many of these long sicknesses that people go through are designed by God to break the person to the point where they do call upon him. Deathbed conversions I don't think are going to be that unusual when this is all finished. However, if anybody's counting on that, that would be presumption, and I don't think it'll happen for them. Uh, Psalm 107 has some other scenarios like this, where they are like drunken men, and they've come to wit's end, then they call out to the Lord. So he'll send these storms into our life. Number eight, miraculous deliverance. We find in John 9, there was a man who was born blind. Now that's trouble. The disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? Well, that was already a ridiculous question. But Jesus said, he was born this way in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Jesus miraculously healed him. It was a demonstration of his power, his ability, and his mercy. And that man became a tremendous witness for the Lord. So it may be that a person could have some kind of severe thing where God is just setting up to do a miracle. That can be. He's done it before. He can do it again. For unbelievers, that's about it. The reason for troubles and all the rest of it could be anything from just the reality of this existence. It could be a direct judgment that's come on them as an individual. It could be demon possession. It could be they're caught up in some kind of demonic attack that God has allowed to happen. It could be they're part of a group that winds up judged by God. It could be that they're just reaping what they've sown in their life. Or it could be that there's afflictions they're suffering that's designed to bring them to God. Or it could be the afflictions they have and God's going to do a miraculous thing. Now for believers, while we could be subject to all of these previous ones as well with some modifications, here's the biggest modification. God says he causes all things to work together towards good to those who continue loving him. It doesn't mean that these black events are good. He uses these black things that come across our path towards good if we continue to seek him, continue to love him, continue to trust him. So that's the biggest thing. It can still be constructive even though it's a terribly destructive type event. So here's why Christians can run into trouble. It's an individual discipline coming from God, but not an individual judgment that like would come on unbelievers. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. He scourges each one he welcomes as a son. All discipline for the moment seems sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. These are blows 
that come from God that are disciplines individualized towards each Christian because of sin that they're doing or involved in where he's determined we're going to correct this. Now, none of us know how much he'll put up with. It's like with your own children. You'll overlook it, overlook it, overlook it, but then there's a point you know that has got to be addressed and corrected. Moving on to number 10, abuse of the Lord's Supper. If a believer partakes of the Lord's Supper casually and is also casually partaking of some particular sin, this is presumption, making one guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. It's a sure-fired way to bring down the hand of God. In other words, if you're saying, yes, I believe you died for me, Jesus, and it was your body being broken for me and the blood to pay for it, and yet I'm continuing on in some kind of sin, God will not put up with that. It says, when we are judged, we are being disciplined, that we might not be damned along with the world. That's what he told the Corinthian believers. For this reason alone, many of you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. You've been taken clear out of this world because of this one offense area. Do not assume God has gone soft. As I was looking through all the denominations trying to figure out where I might fit in, the Christian church started what they call the restoration movement. And the whole point of it was identify what are the essentials of the faith and you rally around that. And then all the things that are non-essentials, you allow tolerance for those things. And in all things, love rules over all. That's what they were saying. As I read about that, I said, gosh, what happened to this movement? Well, do you know what might have happened? They do the Lord's Supper every week. And if you're not serious about pursuing your sin, you are asking for trouble from God. So I don't know. That may be one reason the Christian church is not much of an impact in the world. Number 11, testing God. Now, God does protect believers, but that does not mean the Christian can be reckless and expect God to come to the rescue. Satan quoted protective scripture to Jesus when he was tempting him. He talked about the angels being given charge over you so you won't even dash your foot against the stone. And then he dared Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And Jesus rebuked him, you shall not force a test on the Lord your God. Satan is so brazen, he used the word of God against the word of God, Jesus himself. And Jesus rebuked him with handling the word of God accurately. Now there is a line somewhere between stepping out in faith and being reckless, thus tempting God. But some individuals are quite daring and adventurous and they should not be censored by the more reserved among us. This is ultimately a matter determined between the individual saint and God of what's stepping out in faith and what's just being reckless and where you're testing God. And number 12, conflict in the heavens. Job, we're told very clearly, his troubles generated because of a conflict in the heavens where God was challenging Satan about Job and Satan took up the challenge. Then disaster struck. So read Job 1 and 2 and ask God to spare you, and I ask him to spare me, from such an ordeal. Now, also we find in the New Testament that Satan demanded permission, which is an interesting phrase, demanded permission to be able to sift Peter like wheat. And I think that was because Peter was going to deny Christ three times when he adamantly was saying he would never do that. So Satan says, let me have at him, because he did deny Christ. And Jesus said, you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. It was a serious offense Peter obviously, you know, was restored and was okay, but man, you're talking about walking right up to a line. And Satan demanded to be able to sift him like wheat, and I believe that was given to him. There's no telling what kind of troubles might have come to Peter as well. There would be a conflict in the heavens where God says, would have said, okay, and let these hedges drop. You know, it's possible that, that we're a target like that. I mean, who knows? But it could be. If Job did not write the book of Job, he may not have even known in this lifetime that the genesis of his troubles would have been this conflict in the heavens. Now, this goes into the next one. Number 13 is testing, and this would be testing by God, testing us. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Trials are not going to be something that's easy. These episodes are not brought on by our overt sins, thus attracting like God's discipline. Because the Lord tests hearts, 
And these tests are hard things, but they often bring up dark stuff, exposing deep attitudinal or character flaws. And see, that's what would have happened with Job. Self-righteousness was brought to the fore, which Job didn't even know was there. I'm just certain of it. Now, this conflict in the heavens was also testing from God towards Job to bring out this dark stuff. So it could be several things that are happening, just not one or the other. When we successfully navigate these tests, the believer is more sound in the faith. Moral defects are acknowledged, they're renounced, and then by his grace they're put to death. Now another one, number 14, this is extremely interesting to me. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and on three occasions, I think, not just three requests, three occasions, he was seeking God, let this thing depart from me. Now, why would he be doing that? Paul was convinced, if you take this away, I'll be able to serve you better. And here's the answer he finally got. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And Paul, instead of wanting it to go away, he said, I will gladly receive this so that I can be used by God. This is an amazing use of evil, that Satan, meaning it for a true debilitating impact, that it actually makes Paul where he's going to be able to be used by God. So, a seemingly debilitating thing for us. Is it possible that it makes us where we can actually now be used for eternal expansion of the kingdom of the Son? You know, our God is real big. Number 15, suffering for Christ. For to you it has been granted not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Paul said he did his part in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now Jesus went to the cross, suffered once for all time to pay for our sins. God's been rejected by this world, or is being rejected. But now as a Christian, we enter into that rejection. So we'll suffer for Christ in filling up that which is lacking in his afflictions. There's going to be a point that that ends, and it hasn't filled up yet. We're still here. Now I just say, uh, look, no Christian should be going around looking for this suffering for Christ. It's going to come on its own, so don't go after it. So those are my 15 reasons that I've found in the Bible for why different afflictions might come our way. Some of these are exclusively for Christians. For example, God's not going to be disciplining those who are not his children. Judgment, yes, but not disciplining. Abuse of the Lord's Supper, yeah, it'll finally come to them if they've been involved in that. But not in this life is he going to discipline them for that. He will his own children. A conflict in the heavens, well, that's not going to happen for non-Christians. Or being tested by God, producing endurance in us, that's designed for the children of God. To keep one from sin, like Paul, that's not going to apply to a non-Christian. And nor is the suffering for Christ going to apply. So some of these only apply to Christians, and that's why we can have some of these troubles. Now, or some people have said, I had this big trouble, and it's like, why me? Why me? And the answer that came back was, why not you? And that supposedly solved everything. Well, if it does for some people, that's great. But that doesn't solve it for me. Because I can give God a lot of reasons of why not me. So this thing of why me, I don't know that I even ask that. But to ask why, not in a childish, peevish way, but why are these things happening? Because I know my destiny and glory is going to be, there will be no more troubles. And I know you could prevent all of these troubles here and now. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace. And not only did they not get burned up, there was not even the smell of smoke on them. God's the same God. He can deliver us from the lion's den. He can take us through the Red Sea, open it up. He can keep us from being burnt in the fire. And we find in the book of Job, there were hedges or protections around Job, his family, and his properties. And then there was another hedge around his physical being and another hedge around his actual very life. And God let two of those hedges fall, and Satan attacked. So when hedges fall around me, I know God has allowed it. And I think it is not only correct to ask why, I think it's mandatory to even seek why. 
And here are some of the reasons why. He wants me to serve him in righteousness, peace, and in joy. How can I do that if I have unresolved conflict over some awful thing that's happened to me? How can I serve him in that way? So for me to seek why this is happening, it's not, again, a childish, peevish kind of way, but if he would let me know, just like with Paul, he said, gladly I'll receive this now so I can be used by you. Paul got satisfaction for why the troubles, and he was able to then move forward in righteousness, peace, and joy. And I think God wants the same thing for us. Now, we may not ever find the complete answer because some things are just horrific that happen to people. But I do believe he will give enough insight into why this has happened to where a person can resolve it to a point where they can serve him in righteousness, peace, and in joy. So I ask why and I seek why. And I'm certain many times I will benefit by knowing why, even though I may not like the answer. The other option is just to continue to stay in the dark. So when you have troubles, maybe a good place to start is to review these 15 things and see which ones you can cross off automatically that you know does not apply and which ones might be a possibility. And it may give some direction on how you seek why and ask God to enlighten you of what's happening or if there's something he's needing to communicate with you to where you can successfully navigate the waters that you're in. And I think the last thing I want to say, and I'll close with this, is that I'll get before God with some of these matters and I'll say, okay, are you bigger than this? Well, that's a rhetorical question because I know he is. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And after listing off a bunch of terrible things, even being sheep for the slaughter, he says, in all these things, he makes us more than conquerors or we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. So I ask God, since you're bigger than this, I ask you would make me bigger than this. Now, I'm not pretending to know how to get bigger than the trouble or the problem. But I know God can do that. And I say, if you will do that, come down to my level and do that. If I don't give you thanks, I'll give you thanks at the judgment. But it will bring honor to you. Because as your son, I will be an example of your power to be able to overcome things that may overcome others, but not me as a son of the living God. Isn't that what our goal should be? Where God would make us overcomers? I know he can do it. And I don't, I'm not pretending that any of this is easy. Because I don't want trouble. But you know what? The reality of this existence is I cannot survive this environment. Something's going to bring me down eventually. And many times God will use all of these things to teach me great and mighty things that I have not known. So let's close with that because like I always say, when I do my music videos, listen to this material. If you'll listen, you will indeed learn great and mighty things you haven't known. And this information always and only leads to life and you will indeed live.